as we can hear, <laughs> we are in progress recording. So it is my pleasure today to welcome my excellent guests who will be performing for us next Saturday, October 2nd. Um, before that, we are approaching the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, an official day to be observed. And it's important for our audience to know that this conversation and podcast are taking place on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations. And since before time was recorded, they have shared their culture through stories, conversation, and we're grateful for the care that they have taken of this beautiful land. And I'm happy to introduce my three guests today. They are Leslie Dalla, Robin Dreger Clausen, and Leah Giselle Field. Everybody can give a wave. <laughs> It's like four corners here. <laughs> and um, I'll just give a brief sort of um, introduction to each of these guests. Conductor Leslie Dalla enjoys a multifaceted career spanning the genres of opera, symphonic music, choral and contemporary works. On the podium, he is known for his passionate, dynamic and charismatic approach to music making. He's currently artistic director of the Vancouver Bach Choir and is associate conductor of the Vancouver Opera. Robin Dreger Clausen, and I must quote this from her bio because I love it, has done lots of performing in lots of places. <laughs> Robin, that's just amazing. She loves the costumes and grandeur of opera and adores the personal and int intimate side of song recitals. Robin loves singing contemporary music and is head of the vocal department of the Vancouver Academy of Music, something that surprises her. <laughs> Your bio is just, it's, it's great. I love it. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, my good friend Leah Giselle Field is a mezzo-soprano who is noted for her versatility as a vocalist and the strength of her dramatic presence. She's a graduate of the Vancouver Opera Yolanda M. Ferris Young Artist Program and is the Vancouver Opera Foundation Amatory Bursary recipient and district winner and regional finalist of the Met Opera National Council auditions. Leah has sung in North America, Europe, China, in opera, art song recital with orchestras and chamber ensembles. So Leah has also sung in lots of places. <laughs> Fantastic. A warm welcome to everyone. And I'm just going to jump in with some really fun rapid fire questions. Sometimes I put them at the start, sometimes at the end. And I'm going to start with Les and put him on the spot. Les, after a concert, what is your go to meal or beverage? Probably a cold beer. I hear that a lot, actually. <laughs> I get very thirsty. You get dry. So I like something nice and cold. What about you, Leah? Not very exciting. Um, I live and die by soda water. <laughs> That's refreshing after one has been singing for, for a long time, for sure. That's fantastic. And Robin, what's your go-to post-concert refreshment or meal? Um, well, I will rarely turn down a glass of wine, so that's usually what I do. Yeah. Same here. And, um, my, my other question is if you weren't doing what you do now, what other job would you love to have? Anybody can jump in. <laughs> well, I, I can answer that. Um, I would be a garden designer. Uh, a bread baker, uh, a flamenco dancer. I don't know anything about flamenco dancing. Um, <laughs> uh, just um, maybe I would work at NASA. <laughs> That'd be amazing. What about you, Leah? Would you do anything else or is this like you live and breathe singing? This is it. Well, I mean, I have to say I've tried a lot of times to find something else to do because this may not come as a shock to some people, but to others, um, I'm here to tell you that this isn't always the most practical uh, career path to try to follow. Uh, and most, well, not just singers, most musicians these days have to put together what we euphemistically refer to as portfolio careers. Uh, so like Robin and I are both teachers as well as being singers. And this last year, I spent most of my time being the COVID safety officer for Vancouver Opera. It's basically all the things that you do to enable you to also be able to sing. So I'm not sure I have nearly as satisfying an answer as Robin. 
But um, back in the day before I realized that I wanted to be a musician, I used to think that maybe I wanted to be an actor. Opera definitely, <laughs> opera definitely gives you that chance. Exactly. I cheated. I just smushed it all together. Smushed it together. And Les, what about you? If, if you weren't living this musical life, what? I mean, I love this musical life, but I mean, so if this is like a total fantasy question, I would, I would love to be a, an all pro tennis star. That's amazing. <laughs> I could, I just love tennis. I love watching it. I love playing it. And uh, just, you know, if, if one were to spend a lot of time doing that, you know, that would be kind of beautiful. And if you're really great, you can make some pretty good prize money. So, you know, not bad career, I'd say. Travel is great. That's, that's so great. So then less one rapid fire question, Djokovic or Nadal? Well, I'm going to say Federer. He's my all time favorite player. So sorry i cheated but cheated picked a different option <laughs> um we are so happy that the three of you are going to be performing an art song recital of music composed entirely by women and we first of all want to thank sound on bc for supporting this project thank you so much and thank you to um, bc gaming commission and community grants for their support too um and it's a really special recital and I don't know why we haven't done this before, but Muse West has not programmed an all female composer program before, um, but there's no place to start like the present. So this is really special to us. And Robin, you made a wonderful quote um, and you said, female composers have been often written out of the story of classical music history. Can you please expand on that? That is such a powerful thought. Uh, well, I actually read that really recently in this wonderful book by Sue Monk Kidd called The Book of Longings. Does that show up reversed for you? Yeah, okay. Okay, The Book of Longings. Um, she is a wonderful writer. Um, she wrote The Secret Life of Bees, which was years and years ago. But this book, I just randomly picked it up and... Um, the question of this book is, what if Jesus had had a wife? And um, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Well, okay, let's read this. And, um, you know, and, and her, her take on it, she's like, this is purely fiction. Please understand, I'm not trying to offend anybody. Um, but it's very, um, very likely that he did because his whole um all, all the, the work that's been recorded wasn't until he was in his 30s and so like there's no story between 12 and 30 and um and in that culture you got married <laughs> that's what you did and so her take on this book is what if he'd had a wife and she was just written out of the story and i thought that was such a powerful line um, because there, there's just like that, that goes for so many different stories of, of women. I've been reading a lot of books by, um, Nigerian writers lately, the female Nigerian writers right now, fabulous, fantastic. Um, and all these stories about young women who have so much to say and so much to do. And because of poverty and because of circumstances, their stories are not recorded and not written and they're then you know, not important. And you just think like, how much have we lost in science and in um, mathematics and in discovery and all sorts of things because we haven't, we've only been listening to half of the population and even that the white male population for generations and how, you know, where, where could we be? Uh, if we'd if we'd actually given um, more people a chance, so I just, um, I, yeah, that book really inspired me to kind of go out and look for more, um, just you know what what little what little jewels in our in our um, musical work have been just kind of brushed over. And luckily, there's lots and lots of people researching this right now. There's lots of new books coming out. Um, so, you know, I don't really have to do much work. I can leave it up to other people, but I can learn the songs and perform them. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's where I got that quote from. 
That's amazing. And, and oh, go ahead. can I Let's... jump in with something? Please, uh, just, just to put it out there, because obviously one of these things is not like the other. And when we talked about this program, I, you know, I uh, was approached about uh, playing a recital uh, with these great artists, and uh, I said, of course. And then when when the program developed and we talked about it being an all female uh, composer program, if you recall, I just want to put this out to your listeners that I offered to kind of take myself out of the equation because you know what I mean? It's, I, I thought, you know, and anyways, everybody was like, no, 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 like it's it's fine. You should be a part of this. And so I just, uh, I'm really honored to be a part of this program because I think it's an amazing uh, program of diverse music, uh, but every piece on there is a gem. And uh, I, I feel lucky to, to be a part of this and to have discovered some of these pieces uh, with Robin and Leah. So, uh, I thank you for including me in this, and uh, it's um, I'm I'm really looking forward to to next Saturday and and our rehearsals uh, still coming up this week. It's uh, it's been very gratifying, and it's amazing how this is music. It's first class music. It ranks with with anything, and so it really has been um, neglected unjustly, very very unjustly. So I just want to put that on record. And I think like when you mentioned that last i think what's great about that actually is everyone can be an advocate for this music yeah and that's really important and um that kind of answers one of the topics that robin and i had been chatting back and forth about how can like what can we talk about during this podcast and um presenting these pieces by women why do we have to be intentional about this and i feel that both of you have kind of covered that. And Leah, do you have something you want to add about intentionality with marginalized composers and why this is critical? Well, I think we're at a really interesting point as we hopefully are looking at properly emerging from the pandemic, where we keep hearing people bandying about expressions like building back better. And I think that that's something that can have a really profound meaning in all areas of life. And in terms of artistic programming, I think building back better means building back in a more enlightened and inclusive way. So this program to me is an indication of what we can do to give platform to voices that have been marginalized in the past. You know, um, uh, a body of music that I've always been very passionate about, well, always since I was about 20, um, passionate about promoting is uh, music that's known as, in French as voix étouffée, uh, or in uh, German they call it entartete musique, musique. So it's, um, um, <laughs> in French it's a little more poetic, but in German it's, it's referred to as degenerate music. It's music that was suppressed under Nazism. And that's always been of particular interest to me, but it's um, one sliver of a, an entire artistic world that is represented by this understanding of the power of music and the desire to limit certain parties' access to that kind of power and that kind of uh, power of communication. And I think it's beautiful that now this is another opportunity for us to figure out how to give a uh, platform to, to voices that haven't traditionally had that opportunity. So that's, that's how I feel about this program. I totally agree. And um, as we emerge from this pandemic, um, we're still um, encountering lots of misogyny, lots of anti-Semitism, lots of Asian hate, lots of, um, crimes of like against black people and people of color. And I think that as arts organizations and artists, like our choices actually kind of make a statement about what we value and what's important. And I'm really excited for this program too. And um, Les, you mentioned that you have a connection to the composer, uh, Miss Ueda, and she's been a mentor to you. Um, do you want to talk about that piece on this program, Into the Shimmering, the, the title piece? Yeah, I mean, it's an absolutely exquisite uh, cycle, th th quite short, uh, but three poems basically, I mean, concerning grief. Um, and I got to know Leslie Ueda because um, 
when I was hired uh, by Vancouver Opera, I started off as, as the chorus pianist and she was in those days, the chorus director. And I remember, you know, um, she's someone who always commanded the utmost respect and was, you know, very demanding in her rehearsals, very kind, but I, I learned a whole kind of approach that at that stage, I was just, you know, still a student actually. And uh, it was uh, just awesome for me to, to have that experience and to get to know a lot of the big chorus shows the, from the way she put it together. And then I eventually took over her position and she very graciously actually recommended me. I remember when uh, she made the uh, unexpected announcement that she was going to step down and she recommended to you know, the management and, and uh, the leadership that, that I should do that. And I, I'm always very grateful for that because it, it uh, you know, it meant that she trusted me and I learned so much from her. And uh, she also has a wicked sense of humor and uh, is just a lovely, lovely human being. And I think actually that the com composition I'm sure has always been an interest, but it's something that she really started uh, post working with, at the opera. That's when she really devoted herself full time to it. And, you know, as someone who studied composition, I remember people always saying, you know, it takes at least 10 years to write something that's actually your own and that is any good. But I must say, even I think I did a piece of hers, one of the first things she wrote back 20 years ago, and it was just really good. And so uh, she's, uh, you know, a, a really strong voice, obviously, because it's somebody who's spent uh, her entire life around music and making music of, of so many different kinds. We also share a piano teacher, which is kind of amazing and um, that she studied with in Winnipeg and I studied with in Toronto, who's a dear friend to both of us. So uh, yeah, I just, I think the world of her and I think this is a gorgeous uh, song cycle. And of course she writes equally well for the piano and the voice. So uh, I don't know what Robin, yeah, if you have anything to add to that, but uh, that's a special addition uh, for me to be able to be, uh, play that with Robin. Yeah, um, these songs, Leslie has written a, a couple of cycles that I really enjoyed singing. Um, and so this one was new to me. Um, but the, the poetry by Joy Kogawa is just so hmm, pristine somehow. It's very clean. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and of course, the way Leslie writes it's not easy to learn, but once you understand it, it can't, there's no other way for it to be. It just has to be that way. And it always kind of keeps me on my toes. It can never be, I can never go into robot mode with her songs, but they feel so right every time. And the way she sets text, the colors that she puts into the piano, especially I just find so, satisfying so they've been a real uh, it's been really lovely to revisit because of course we haven't done any recitals in a really long time and uh, it's really nice to to sink my teeth into something that is so satisfying and worth it like worth the hours of work it takes to that you have to put into them i'm also really excited that um so four composers on the program are um, associated with BC or live in BC, Sylvia Rickard and Leslie Ueda, Jocelyn Morlock and um, Jean Coutard. And um, Jean Coutard is no longer with us, but has influenced generations of Canadian composers. Um, but Leslie and Jocelyn will be in the audience. And that is just, to me, such a unique opportunity that I'm so happy for as well. And um, Unfortunately, Sylvia can't make it. Uh, it's a bit of a trip for her, but um, it's just remarkable to know that um, there's people around us creating this. Uh, next question I have for Leah. Um, how do you push forward artistically when you don't feel inspired? And I know COVID has been a weird time. It's weird to perform in front of a camera and then it's streamed and there's COVID rules about how to rehearse at opera. <laughs> Yes, they certainly, are. they certainly are. How do you stay inspired? Um, the opportunity to be making music with other people at a high level and music that we care about is, is the inspiration. 
to be totally honest with you. It's, it's strange. Things obviously aren't back to normal. Um, there are things that we will continue to miss for a while yet, but the months of not having the opportunity to make music with other people um, made an incredible impact, I'm sure on everyone, but I'll, I'll just speak from my perspective, but it was, um, it was devastating, actually. And I took it really hard. There were several months where things were so uncertain and it was so difficult. I just, I, I couldn't sing for the first several months that things were going on and that's never happened to me before. And it was, it felt like a major loss of identity. Um, and so the, the gift of an opportunity like this to put together music that as Robin was saying is so is so worthwhile to dig into and put the time and the effort into because there's so much process with music like this uh, and by music like this I mean contemporary music it's um, I know uh, Robin and, and perhaps Les uh, have done some of this some of this music before but for me this is a, a program of completely new repertoire and that is both um, daunting and totally inspiring because there's a way you approach music that you've never had the opportunity to explore that's so different from stuff that's already in your back pocket stuff that you're revisiting and it's it's always a musical exploration and it's you know it's always you're always working with the text you're always striving to put together a more complete performance and to to inhabit the music more precisely um, and in a more meaningful way but the intellectual exercise of learning contemporary music um, that you haven't previously encountered for a program uh, that's being presented as the first big program out after not having done anything for all of these months. That, that's the motivation right there. It's, it's getting to, to live in the music um, with, um, with colleagues whose musical viewpoints I respect so deeply. That's a wonderful answer. I, I think that it is the chance to work together that does inspire us. And um, a friend of mine recently wrote that he realized through the pandemic that he needed community. And I think we've all been feeling that quite acutely. <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward to this recital so much as well. Um, and another musical question, I'm gonna throw this one to our artist in residence, Leslie Gala. Oh, my podcast editor told me to stop hitting the table. I'm gonna work on that. <laughs> um, sorry, Josh, when you put your headphones on, you're gonna hear it again. <laughs> um, so, Les, you prepare to conduct operas, you have prepared to be the repetiteur for operas, you prepared song recitals, is the preparation different for opera and song recital? Are there similarities? Are there differences? Um, I mean, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I think in from a philosophical point, the preparation is always the same. Um, uh, and when it comes to say even contemporary and classical works, I forget who. Uh, is, has said this quote, but it's such a great one that, you know, when, when one approaches contemporary music, they should approach it like a classical masterpiece. And when one approaches a classical masterpiece, they should approach it as if it was just hot off the press. And that's an excellent philosophical way of, you know, again, not falling into traps of uh, when one is performing a, a standard work that one has heard many, many people do and just trying to imitate, you know, uh, some of the greatest performances, that kind of thing. And having with the new piece, having uh, the care and respect that one would, would, of course, lavish, not lavish, but uh, that is due to Beethoven, Bach, whoever, Florence Price, um, any of, you know, anybody. Um, so there is that. Um, it, it, from as a, from a conducting point of view and from like playing the piano it's it's a different thing for the you know when you conduct it's a much more sort of intellectual process and, and like really really studying not to say that doesn't happen uh with with playing the piano but then you also have to play notes when you play the piano so there's a kind of physical practicing that happens which which doesn't happen with conducting you know so um it's and i love the fact i feel very lucky that i i get to bounce in the in those two worlds 
constantly to keep it really fresh and the two inform each other all the time. So that's a, that's a nice thing. That's wonderful. I'm going to bounce our final question to Robin. And Robin, you have been um, reading a lot during the pandemic and you love books. So I'm going to throw you a non-musical question. What are some titles that you would recommend to our audience? Oh, where to start? Okay. Um, I was looking at my bookshelf. <laughs> I just read uh, recently this wonderful book called The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abi Dare. Again, Nigerian. Uh, it's just, it's just such an exciting story um, about a young girl who just knows that she wants to go to school and knows that she deserves it and that she deserves to have knowledge. And it's just so inspiring and wonderful. Um, I have recently discovered um, Priti Umrigar, who is just um, a lovely, I think she's American Indian or maybe she's British. Um, she writes such beautiful prose. It's really lovely. And her stories are just like, oof. <laughs> um, uh, one of the first one I read uh, was called Everybody's Son. And it was, it, it's, uh, she must be American because it's an American story. And oh my goodness, the whole way through, you're just like, don't make that choice. Don't, that's the wrong choice. Don't, and of course they make a lot of really wrong choices for, and with um, consequences that you just can't see coming. It, they're really, it's, she's a wonderful writer. Um, and as someone who also really, really loves sci-fi, um, uh, there is um, a series now, now, don't laugh at the title of these books, but they're called the Lady Astronaut novels. And they're oh, kind great. Of, they're fantastic. And so they're kind of set like in a what if world. It's very much like the world we know, but what if in uh, you know 1955 women had been working at NASA and had like, cause there were lots and lots of women and um, black women, honestly, working in the mathematics departments and were like calculators basically before computers and did amazing things. And so there's lots of wonderful adventure, like going to Mars and settling on the moon and, and they're wonderful. And um, I like, you know, I just love them. <laughs> so if anyone's looking for something kind of fluffy, but also kind of serious, they're really wonderful. That sounds fantastic. I want to thank all of our guests today, Leah, Les, and Robin. Everyone is welcome to join us on October 2nd at 7.30 p.m. at St. Helens Anglican Church in Point Grade. It is on West 8th Avenue and Trimble. Please be prepared to present proof of first dose of vaccination and photo ID, please. Um, it will be fully masked audience and there's no intermission. We're keeping things a bit shorter. And it has been a pleasure to have this conversation today.